Hello there, you wonderful game dev people. Come in, take a seat, get comfy. In this video, we're going to be examining modules and plugins with the Unreal Engine. We'll look at what they are, why you might want to use them, and how to create and work with them. This is an important topic for anyone who'll be working on anything larger than the absolute tiniest of projects, and it's still good to know about even then. So are you ready? Then let's dive right in. What are modules in C++ coding, and why would you want to use them? If you're a beginner, it's possible you don't yet know, but in Unreal, using C++, all your code exists inside modules. Even if you don't specifically make one yourself, every C++ Unreal project will have a default module. You can also put your code into additional modules, and in a nutshell, that's basically what a module is. It's a collection of classes. Before we look at what you can do with modules, it's worth taking a moment to understand Unreal itself. When you write your own games, you have access to all the features of the Unreal Engine, which are provided to you via, yes, you guessed it, modules. In fact, there are a lot of modules, hundreds, over a thousand, I think. I couldn't actually be bothered to count them all. You can check it out in your IDE. In your Solution Explorer, go to the Engine folder, UE5, Source. When you look inside there, you learn your first lesson about modules. You can group them into logical collections using subfolders. Epic have folders for editor, runtime, etc. And within those folders, there are subfolders grouping things in further different collections. Let's take a peek at the runtime folder. Sheesh, there are a load of folders in there. Just look at them all. Are they all modules? Pretty much, yeah. Oh look, there's a JSON one, and a JSON utilities one. Interesting. So, the official documentation describes modules as the building blocks of Unreal Engine's software architecture. You can organize your code into modules to create more efficient and maintainable projects. Right, well, that certainly sounds interesting, but it also sounds a little bit like they're telling me, tidy your room. Is that the point of modules? Is it just something trying to force me to code in a tidier way? Well, not at all. It can certainly help you produce more orderly code, but don't worry, you can use modules and still write really awfully messy code if that's what you really want to do. Seriously though, using modules can give you some of the following benefits. I use the words hopefully or potentially when describing some of them, because while modules offer you these benefits, it's still up to you to use them in a manner that actually makes that happen, okay? Modules will, hopefully, help you think about your code in a building blocks type manner, meaning you create better structure for your project's code, exposing only the parts to other modules that are needed by them, and keeping internal bits somewhat hidden. They make your code, potentially, more reusable, especially when you take that a step further and make plugins which can use modules too, and we'll look at making those in more detail later on. They make compiling your app potentially better because the compiler only needs to recompile the module you're working on. The other modules that you already successfully compiled the last time you did a build are fine and generally don't need to be recompiled again until you make changes to their code. That means you ultimately get faster builds, which makes that iterative development cycle thing a little bit nicer. You can make different types of modules. For example, gameplay modules, which run when the game is um, played, but also editor modules, which can add new features to the editor or automate the editor based on tasks. You have some control over when modules are loaded, the order in which they're loaded, which can be useful if you know your module depends on something else which needs to be loaded first or is required at a specific point in the engine lifetime. And because Unreal knows how everything in your project is linked together, it can ignore modules which are not required. It can also include or exclude modules based on various conditions, having modules which are only used for debugging versions of the game, or are only used by the editor, or only used for specific platforms, for example. Okay, so that sounds good. How can we make our own modules? Adding your own modules is not actually very difficult, although considering how some other aspects of Unreal are quite automated, and realising how useful and fundamental to Unreal modules are, it's a little surprising that the Unreal Editor doesn't seem to have a wizard for making them. You can create them with automated tools, and of course you can do it manually. We'll look at both ways. With automated tools, such as JetBrains Rider, you can add new modules simply by right-clicking in an appropriate place in the solution tree and selecting Add Unreal Module. A pop-up tool window lets you fill in the few parameters required before the appropriate directory structure is made containing the minimum files needed. I don't know if other tools, such as Visual Assist within Visual Studio, allow you to do this as well. I assume they do. But I do know that my Visual Studio 2022 installation set up for Unreal Dev, which now has templates 
templates for adding Unreal classes still didn't seem to have anything for directly adding modules. Perhaps there is a nice free VS plugin adding such a feature. If you know of one, please drop a comment. I'll check it out and add it to the description of the video so that others can find it more easily. The manual method. The Unreal documentation tells you what you need to do to set things up manually to add new modules. And even if you are using some nice tool that does it all for you, like Rider, it's worth knowing about the structure and all the different pieces so you understand what is actually going on. The first thing you need to understand though is that modules are split into two main kinds. There are regular modules, which is what we will make and what we are talking about right now. And there is also the primary game module, which is a module but it's a little bit different. All projects have a primary module, and although you might modify its code files for various reasons, you generally don't need to create them yourself, as they are made as part of every project template. So then, to make the modules, we do the following. First up, you make a directory for your module and give it the same name you want the module to have. It will be placed somewhere under your source directory. This is going to be your modules root directory. Modules can exist somewhere under the source directory of your project if they are project modules, or somewhere under the source directory of your plugin if they are plugin modules. It's basically the same deal in either case. Don't worry too much about plugins for now though, I'll go back over this later when we look at making those. I say somewhere under the source directory because modules can be placed in other subdirectories, nested as deep as you like, if you want to structure things by using folders to group certain modules together. You could also attempt to hide your code in a nested directory structure so deep that your senior dev might never find it when they try to do your code review. Okay, the point I'm trying to make here is, a couple levels deep might be good and help you structure things, but probably best not to go crazy, okay? In the module's root directory you created, make a file with the same name as the module, adding .build.cs to the end, like so. Your module name .build.cs. We've used the build.cs file before in other videos, so hopefully you're at least aware of it now. The contents of that file are going to define the dependencies that this module has on other modules, and it's how Unreal works out what to do with your module when your project is built. It's probably going to start out looking something a little bit like this one. We'll come back to this file a little later and explain things a bit more. Next, you want to create folders called public and private inside that module's root folder. You then add yourmodulename.cpp to the private folder and optionally yourmodulename.h to the public folder. The .h file is optional and only required if you want to override any of the virtual methods provided by the interface base class, which I talk about in a moment. If you don't, you can use a default implementation, which only requires just the cpp file. Generally, because I'm using Rider and it creates both files, I tend to have both, even if I'm not intending to override those interface methods. And I'm fine with that, because the file is there if I decide to do so at a later stage and it doesn't really hurt anything. We are going to use these to register our module and also to run any code we want when the module is started up and shut down. In the .h file, we will define a class which inherits from iModuleInterface. The standard for module interface derived classes is to have the word module appended to the end of the name. Using an IDE like Rider will do that automatically for you. Meaning, if you were to call your module myModule, the class would be called fMyModuleModule. So maybe don't give your module a name ending in the word module? If you have been immersed in learning Unreal C++ coding for a while, you may have gotten used to making Unreal U-Class classes, which derive from U-Object. And it's worth pointing out that this isn't one of those. And although it derives from a class with an initial I in the name, meaning it's an interface, it isn't one of the Unreal interfaces either. For this reason, your class should be named F module name module. It's just a plain C++ base class with some virtual methods methods defined that either do nothing or return a boolean value as a result. You override them if you need to in your derived class. The most commonly overridden methods are startup module and shutdown module, but you don't actually need to override anything if you don't need to. As I just mentioned, there is a default implementation you can use instead if you don't want to override anything or have your own header file. We need to register the module, which we do with a macro call placed in the C++ file. 
If you want to use the default implementation and you're not overriding anything, you call this macro passing f default module impl as the first parameter. If you want to override the methods and you have defined your own i module interface derived class, then you pass that as the first parameter to the macro call. Hey there, this is video editing me talking now. Listening back to that last bit about manually making Unreal modules, two things came to mind. Firstly, it is all good information to know because once you learn it, you know what bits you need to play with to make modules do what you want them to do. And you understand more about how Unreal Engine code is all structured. But perhaps more importantly, if you are a beginner, all this crap about needing a specific folder structure, module interfaces and macro calls, it's well, it's pretty awful really. And made worse because the original assumption from Epic was that you needed to make this yourself manually for every module you create and once you understand the benefits you will want to potentially make many modules for most games. So in case you didn't catch me saying it earlier do yourself a favor go find one of the free plugins that take care of it for you. Use Rider, use Visual Assist or something else. Hell if you don't want to do any of that at the very least write yourself a batch file to do it for you. It's important for you to understand the structure but it's something that quite honestly no one should be doing manually when they work on projects. Okay back to pre-editing me. Okay so now you have your shiny new empty module. What you gonna do with it? And what's the deal with the public and private folders? Okay, let's talk about the folders first. The easiest thing to mention is that irrespective of anything else, your .cpp files go in the private folder. That's the implementation code which gets compiled to make the module do whatever it's gonna do. And nothing else should ever need to reference those files directly, so they're private. Your header files, the .h files, will either go in the private or the public folders, depending how they are used. If they declare classes which are only used and referenced inside this module, by other classes in this module, then they will be in the private folder. And if they are required to be exposed to modules outside of this module, they go in the public folder. When you add new classes using the new class wizard in the Unreal Engine, or a tool like Riders Add New Unreal class you were given the option to say that a class is either public or private and the resulting files are placed in the appropriate folders for you. The boilerplate files that these wizards make for you will have other slight differences depending if you choose public or private. So, where you put the header files for the class is important, but that's only part of what matters. The way you define the classes in your module will give it varying levels of exposure to other modules. The terminology here can get a little bit confusing, with words such as private and public meaning fairly different things in different situations. It's worth pointing out that when talking about modules, private and public are nothing to do with the private, protected, public, scope keywords that you use when defining your class. Class. For this discussion, I've tried to use words like internal and external to try and actually explain what I mean as I go in an attempt to avoid confusion and help you learn. Just understand that when you work with seasoned Unreal developers or read certain documentation, you might hear different terms and see public and private used more, okay? Internal module classes. These are going to be classes that other code in the same module can use, but other modules cannot. Unreal calls these private classes. Nothing outside this module can use the classes or cast to them or call their functions. It's worth noting that we're talking about C++ here. If you make your classes blueprintable or use other specifiers, then users may still be able to create blueprints derived from them and add instances to levels, if it's an actor for example, as long as the module has been loaded. And this is what the new C++ class wizard in the editor will make for you when you ask for a new private class. If you add the specifier minimal API to the uClass macro, then Unreal will expose basic type information about this class to other modules. What that means is you can now write C++ code in other modules that use this class. Other modules can subclass it, making their own classes that inherit from it. And you can use it in casting operations. And you could call inline functions if it had any. To expose specific functions for use outside of this module, we can then 
mark them with our module's API macro. And this macro is automatically created for us by Unreal. It's the name of the module with underscore API slapped on the end, all in capitals. For example, module name underscore API. In this example, the function do something useful is callable from other modules which use this module. The function do something useful internal is not. Only other code in the same module should try to call it. And yes, even though both have the C++ public scope, which is why your IDE might be perfectly happy with you writing code that tries to call the internal version of the function and may not indicate to you that there is a problem until you attempt to compile the code and it fails with unresolved external symbol errors. We can choose to expose the entire class to other modules by using that same myModule underscore API macro, but this time placing it immediately before the name of the class in the class declaration, which is generally the code created for you when you create a new public class using the editor's new class wizard. This means that code in other modules can access anything that would normally be exposed by the public C++ specifier or protected if the code is making a class that inherits from this class. So we've made a new module, we've put some classes in it, and we marked some of them with the underscore API specifier so that we can use them from code outside that module. We go into some code in another module and we add a hash include file path for the thing we want to use. IntelliSense in our IDE maybe underlines it in red or something, but we're kind of used to that because in Visual Studio at least, IntelliSense for Unreal projects isn't worth a bean. So we try to compile the code and it fails, telling us that IntelliSense was actually correct. It can't find the include file that we gave it. The reason for this is that before you can use one module from another module, we need to explain to Unreal that we actually want to do that. The first thing we should do is update the U project or U plugin file where we want to use the module to tell it about the module we want to use. This might have already been done automatically for you, depending how you added the module to the project or plugin. But if you simply copied a module folder from one project to another, then it's useful to know what you need to do. For an Unreal project, you edit the project's .u project file. If you're making a plugin, edit its .u plugin file. Add the module to the list of modules. Both are JSON format text files, and you can add an entry for your new module similar to this. In this way, you can control at what point the engine will load the module, the loading phase. For now, leave that just as default. Then we need to set up the module that will use our target module, telling it that it depends on the new module. We do this in the .build.cs file for any module that wishes to use the new module. The .build.cs files are partly responsible for how Unreal builds your projects. Perhaps somewhat surprisingly to long-time users of Visual Studio, Unreal doesn't actually care very much about your solution file, the SLN file. In fact, it's only really there so the IDE can understand your Unreal project and let you work with it in the IDE. Unreal's building and packaging stuff completely ignores it. Those .build.cs files offer you a few different things for configuring how their associated modules are going to be built. The two most commonly used are both lists of strings containing the names of other modules that this module is dependent on. These are called private dependency module names and public dependency module names. And you may have already encountered them if you have tried to use various code examples or snippets you found online. A few questions immediately present themselves. What do they do? What is the difference between the private and public versions of dependencies? How and when should we be using them? And should you just stick as many module names as possible randomly and repeatedly in both places until your code magically compiles and then forget all about it? To answer the last question first, no, don't do that. And once we go over these things, you won't need to. Now the Unreal documentation says, you should use the public dependency module names list if you use the classes from a module publicly, duh, such as in a public.h file. This will make it possible for other modules that depend on your module to include your header files without issues. This is called a dependency chain. You should put a module's name in the private dependency module names list if they're only used 
used privately, such as in CPP files. Private dependencies are preferred wherever possible as they can reduce your project's compile times. You can make many dependencies private instead of public by using forward declarations in your header files. Now, that description is certainly a good start. But it may not be completely obvious to a beginner what it really means and exactly what the implications of it are. So let's talk about hash includes. If you're already really comfortable with how hash include files and forward declarations work, maybe skip over this section. But I see a lot of people getting in all sorts of a mess over these things, so it's probably worth just explaining clearly what the deal is. So what is a hash include? Well, when you hash include a file, you are instructing the compiler to insert the contents of that file at that point before it does the actual compilation. You may have noticed that the majority of header files will start with the instruction hash pragma once. And the purpose of that is to make sure that the file does not get included multiple times, even if you literally have several places where it is included. Basically, if you try to include it more than once, the compiler realizes and does not insert the contents again. And that's important because we don't always know in what order certain files will be processed by the compiler. And those headers do need to have various includes to declare what they actually depend on. So when we use those hash includes in our headers, we're telling the compiler that this file will be using something declared in that include, and then the compiler can work out in what order it will need to parse everything to be able to eventually compile and link all our code together. Although not strictly necessary for classes in C++, we usually pair one header file, .h, with one source file, .cpp. The cpp file will generally hash include the related .h file file, often as the first line in the file. And this is where it's worth pointing out the different jobs that these two files do. The CPP file has our source code in it. That's the stuff which actually does something when it's compiled. The .h file has declarations in it. That is to say, it generally describes how certain things, such as classes, are structured, including the access scope of properties and functions, and the types passed or returned by those functions. But generally speaking, it doesn't have any actual code in it. And before anyone else moans that header files can have code in, I know, usually in the form of something called inline functions. But that's not how the majority of code is written. And as this is a tutorial, let's not muddy the water too much, okay? So the purpose of the CPP file is actually fairly easy to understand. It has the code. The header file is not so simple because it's actually used in several ways. The compiler uses it to know about which functions it will be expecting to find in the code in the CPP files. And and to order things in such a way that code which depends on other code can be compiled in the correct order. The header files are not only used by the compiler to create that code though, they're used by any other code which will use that code. For example, you may compile a library of C++ functions into a DLL file, which you sell to people to use in their own code projects, without ever giving them the CPP files. But for their compiler to be able to work with that DLL, they're still going to need the .h header files because these describe everything which is needed and allow the linker to connect the code you write in your project to the code already compiled in the DLL, for example. And yes, I'm vastly oversimplifying how compilers and linkers work, so I'll put a link in the video description if you are the kind of person who would like to understand the compilation and linking process in more depth. Anyway, in a header, we can hash include other headers that declare stuff we're gonna use for that class, for example. But there is something else we can do. We can use something called a forward declaration. As stated, when you hash include something, the compiler inserts the entire contents of that file at that point. If that file itself also includes other files, then they will be chained together and everything will be included. And that can result in a whole load of stuff being included just because you needed to say that a specific function will be returning a pointer to a specific type of class declared in one of those files. So instead of including that file, we can just tell the header that there is a class with a specific specific name and we're going to use that and the compiler will keep an eye out for that class later in the compilation. We can do this because a pointer is not the actual class. Generally speaking, for any given platform, all standard pointers are the same length because all they will contain is a runtime memory address of where an instance of the class is to be found. By using the forward declaration, we may benefit from faster compile times because we're not having to include a bunch of file content we don't actually need at that point. So then, in the C++ 
CPP file, we have the hash include to the .h file. So the code in the CPP file effectively knows about the forward declare in the .h. But remember, the forward declare doesn't give any actual information about the class we referred to. All we know at this time is it's a pointer. And that's why if you want to have code in the CPP file, which is going to do anything meaningful with instances of that forward declared class, such as call member functions or access properties, then the CPP file will need to have the relevant include file for the class itself, not just the forward declare. The TLDR for all that is simply this. We prefer to use forward declarations in header files, .h, and required hash includes in the CPP files where possible. This will generally result in better compiler performance and will also help with certain situations where you might get circular references. But that's a different story and probably more down to bad architecture of your code. Anyway, going back to our modules. From various conversations with other developers, I think that a possible source of confusion comes from the use of the words public and private in this case. As these words are used in several situations, the meaning is not always as clear as it might be. In most object-oriented languages, including C++, public and private have very specific meanings when we talk about subjects such as the classes we write, the functions and the properties within those classes, relating to how other things are able to use the particular subject in question. In fact, the Unreal documentation points this out, saying, saying, do not have any relation to the private, public, or protected access specs files in your C++ code. Rather than making a module which is marked as public or private, which, if you think about it, might not actually make much sense, you are stating that when one module, for example, we'll call it module A, uses another module, module B, it uses it in a manner which is private, which which might more accurately be called internal or maybe self-only usage. And this means that a third module, module C, which uses module A, does not also need to know about module B because it won't be using anything that's hash included from module B. The public module declaration, however, is saying that in order for module C to properly use module A, it also needs knowledge of module B because it's going to be dealing with stuff from hash include .h files in it. This might be thought of as shared usage or change usage because we are in effect defining a chain of dependencies. Okay, so a private dependency is a module that the private stuff going on in your module is going to use, but that the code which uses your module may not need itself. Public dependencies are the opposite. They are modules that the code using your module will also need to depend on to actually be able to use the code what the actual f still confused okay maybe let's illustrate the point Let's say we have a module called Advanced Ballistics, which knows all about stuff to do with shooting guns. It can do all sorts of clever math stuff to calculate bullet drop over distance, wind offsets, all that kind of stuff. And then we have another module called Standard Sniper, which knows specifically about sniper related activities and which uses the Advanced Ballistics module for some of the calculations that it needs. And then we have our game called Pew Pew Shooter, which of course has as its default primary module of the same name. Now, we know that Standard Sniper uses Advanced Ballistics module, and we know that the Pew Pew Shooter uses Standard Sniper. Therefore, Standard Sniper needs a dependency on Advanced Ballistics, and Pew Pew Shooter needs a dependency on Standard Sniper. That all kind of makes sense. Now, in the Advanced Ballistics module, we have two public classes, one called Shooter Calculator, and another called Bullet Flight Characteristics. Shooter Calculator is a class that other modules can call to perform calculations about shooting. And bullet flight characteristics is basically just data. In this example, it's a U object derived class, but it could also be a struct. Regardless of if we use a public or private module dependency entry for advanced ballistics in our standard sniper.buildcs, the classes in standard sniper could now use the public code in the advanced ballistics module. The shooter calculator class in advanced ballistics has two methods we can call. The first method takes an f vector as a parameter and returns an f vector as a result. The second method also takes an f vector as a parameter, but it returns a pointer to a u bullet flight characteristics as a result. 
standard sniper can call both those methods as long as it has either a public or private dependency to the advanced ballistics module. When we might get problems however is when pew pew shooter starts using the sniper shooter module. If sniper shooter has any function itself which either takes a U bullet flight characteristics as a parameter or returns one as a result and pew pew shooter tries to call that function. If standard sniper has private dependency to advanced ballistics things will now effectively be broken because pew pew shooter needs to refer to the U bullet flight characteristics class defined in that module but it has no way to know about it because standard sniper is effectively exposing a class from the advanced ballistics module then it should use a public dependency for that module. If it did that pew pew shooter is fine just having a dependency on standard sniper and unreal's tools are smart enough to work out that there is a chain of additional dependencies that are also required and it handles all that for you behind the scenes and the includes will simply work. Of course, in this case, you could get around the error by manually adding a dependency to advanced ballistics in the pewpewshooter.build.cs. But as nothing in pewpewshooter is directly using the contents of advanced ballistics, that's probably not the best way to go about it. Note. It's also worth pointing out that if you monkey around with all these things, changing dependencies from public to private in your code and trying to compile and recompile and changing things again, sometimes things might actually work when they shouldn't do. And that's because only the modules that have actually changed may be recompiled. It is completely possible things will seem fine and only when you change something in another module which causes that to be compiled later on will you start to see the errors and wonder why the hell it's suddenly happening. This is one reason why if you mess with the .build.cs file you should generally rebuild the solution and do a full recompile. So you know just be aware of that. To illustrate how this might be used in practice, let's take a moment to consider a more practical example. Our tiny studio is working on a project called Personal Space Anxiety Defender Squad 9000 GO, a first person game with an overly complex time travel narrative centered around a secret organization of halfophobic super agents. In this project, we know that many different types of ranged weapons are going to be central to the game. So gathered together in the basement of the lead designer's grandma's house, we have an important planning meeting to discuss it. We even get sandwiches and cookies from grandma. We think long and hard about all sorts of ranged weapons and how they should work in our game and maybe also in the series of sequels that we are obviously assuming we will get to make because you know forward planning. We consider that some ranged weapons might have limited ammo, bullets or arrows while others might be effectively infinite like a carbon neutral solar powered laser for example. We decide that some ranged weapons might have a pre-fire duration before they actually shoot and or a cool down afterwards to represent all sorts of things from the drawing of a medieval bow to the capacitor baffle on a gauze cannon heat cycling after firing. We decide that some ranged weapons will fire over long distances in a straight line nearly instantaneously unaffected by things such as wind or gravity like a laser while others may such as arrows or even bullets travel in an arc eventually falling to the ground if they don't hit something first. After having talked discussed and argued about all these things we finally agree that our game game seriously depends on being able to do the whole lot and so the creative department is dismissed so the dev types can contemplate on how we will actually get the job done. The creative department takes a couple extra cookies with him when he leaves. First we decide to make a module for ranged weapons in a generalized manner. It can be used for this game and for our sequels and maybe lots of other games we plan to make too because dreams. We spend about two and a half hours considering various options and finally decide to call the module ranged weapons. Inside that module we will provide code for a number of different things. It will have a public class for all the ranged weapons to derive from called U ranged weapon base and we'll also stick a couple of default ranged weapons in there to make testing easier. U simple hit scan gun and U simple projectile gun which both derive from that U ranged weapon base. We also decide that we will make another module specifically for this particular game to deal with the details of some very particular weapons. We name that one PSA1 Ranged Weapons. 
our game uses some custom physics because, well, you know, why not reinvent the wheel when you already have more than enough work to do? Those custom physics are contained in another module, somewhat unsurprisingly for this story called Custom Physics. And so far, in the basic testing we've done, they've been working pretty well. The player can pick up, drop, slide, throw objects, and they act as they should in the real world. Nice. The lead programmer turns to the others and says, guys, I think the ranged weapons module should use the physics solution we have already made. You know, for the bullet drops and wind and whatnot. And everyone agrees. Okay, so how does that little lot actually work in terms of public, private, dependency references and why? We have the following modules, PSA1 game, this is the project's primary module, ranged weapons, PSA1 ranged weapons, and custom physics. And we can say the following about them. Custom physics has no extra dependencies above some standard Unreal stuff that most modules have. Ranged weapons depends privately on custom physics because we use it to calculate projectile drops and wind deviation, but nothing defined by custom physics is a public dependency because none of the functions of the public classes in ranged weapons either accept parameter types defined in custom physics nor do they return types which are types defined in custom physics and the module doesn't include any classes inherited from custom physics. PSA1 ranged weapons depends publicly on ranged weapon because it derives classes from and has functions which return classes or interfaces which are defined in ranged weapon meaning that any code using it will also need to know about ranged weapon module and our primary module PSA1 game will depend either privately or publicly on whatever it needs. Having public dependencies for the primary module is generally not required because nothing is really depending on the primary module as such because it's effectively the root of the dependency chain. If you understand that you'll realize the primary module could also have all of its dependencies public it doesn't actually make any real difference. Hopefully that makes the public private dependency thing a little clearer. So let's get on to plugins. What are plugins on Unreal and why would you use them? Well, plugins are a way of grouping stuff together in a reusable package. Plugin can contain code modules, but it doesn't have to. And a plugin can contain assets, but it doesn't have to do that either. I mean, it should contain something, okay? Otherwise, what's the point? You can have one or more code modules inside each plugin. And just like modules in the main project, the modules included in a plugin can specifically target the runtime game or the editor or both, just like any module can. All the regular rules apply. Now, if you are making for your own projects, you're pretty much free to do what you like. But if it's something you want to publish on the Unreal Marketplace, then there are some additional rules. Plugins can be used for making convenient libraries of assets. Remember, just because you might use a plugin, which is a library having many assets inside it, when you package the project, Unreal will work out what you actually used and only cook and package what is needed for the final publication. And of course, you're perfectly free to include both C++ code and other assets in the same plugin. One of the main reasons that many people are drawn to the idea of plugins is to sell them on the marketplace. Making an entire game and publishing it can be a vast and daunting challenge, especially for small teams or solo devs. But when you think about it for a bit, it seems like maybe you could make your game dev fortune from selling plugins and that that might be more achievable. This will be a subject that a lot of people who watch this video are probably interested in. But because it isn't really about creating plugins, I decided to put that information into a separate video. Let's face it, you got to learn how to actually make them first before you can start selling them, right? Anyway, so how can we make our own plugins? Making your own plugins is actually very simple. Unlike modules, which still don't seem to have any interface in the editor for directly making them, plugins do. If you open the plugins window from the editor, main menu, edit plugins, you'll see there's the option to add a new plugin. After you select this, you choose a basic type of plugin from the list. Now don't be scared by this. It's just selecting some boilerplate. It's only a template. It isn't really gonna do anything you can't change later on. When when I used to use this method, I generally selected the blank template. You can enter some basic details such as the name of the new plugin and your author details and hit OK. Then you have the unusually long pause while the project files are all shuffled around for you. I said that I used to use this because, of course, I now use Rider to do it. All you need to do in Rider is right click on your project in the Solution Explorer and select Add Unreal Plugin. A dialog box pops up where you can enter the same kind of information as in the Unreal 
real editor, and you can even choose from several templates if you're somehow intimidated by the blank one. Either way, that's all that's needed to create the plugin itself. The required folder structure is made for you with a .u plugin file and additional files depending on whatever template you might have selected. So then what? Once you have the plugin, it's up to you what you want to do with it. You can add whatever modules for code you might want, as described earlier. In addition, once you compile and run the project in the editor, you can display the content folders for the plugin in the content window, where you can add assets in the same way as you do for the project itself. So, it's been some months since Personal Space Anxiety Defender Squad 9000 Go was released, and the response was fantastic. A couple of big name streamers picked it up early on, and it just went totally insane. Sales went through the roof. We have won a bunch of awards from organisations we never even heard of. Seriously, I never actually heard of most of them. The constantly growing fan base are already hungry for more, and our small studio has been approached by a large publisher eager to back our sequels. We did a pretty good job of engineering the first one, which gives us something solid to base a follow-up on, but we feel that this time we can do something better, bigger, and more amazing. To that end, our visionary games designer has come up with a winning move that's going to smash things right out of the park. He calls it the Use Your Illusion maneuver, and basically it means instead of releasing a single great game packed full of excellent things, we're going to release two games at the same time, albeit with a single game's worth of stuff that's actually good, just kind of padded out with a bunch of stuff that isn't so great. Any Anyway, in our lovely new offices, the team gets back together to hammer out the details for the new games. Our sudden success hasn't changed us at all, and we engage in the same friendly back and forth exchanges of ideas while the in-office sommelier takes our wine order. After a conference call with a representative from our new publisher about improving our ESG score by including six more shades of blue as player selectable hair colours, the devs are left alone once again to discuss game specific implementation details. We decide that that, although we are making two separate games, a majority of the code will actually be exactly the same. So instead of basing things solely on modules as we did the first time around, we're going to use plugins. There will be a PSA base materials plugin with no code, just materials and material instances, material functions and textures, and it will be used by both games. We will have separate game projects for the two games that will use the plugins, but we will also have a plugin development project where plugins are actually made and initially tested before being included in one of those game projects. The generic ranged weapon module that we had in the first game will be moved into a ranged weapon plugin. And the specific ranged weapons we built for the first game will also be moved, but this time that plugin will also contain the specific meshes, materials, sound effects, and any other assets required by those weapons. Our custom physics module turned out to be great. It performed better than any of the mainstream physics solutions available. So we decided to package that module into another plugin and add an editor module that lets level designers set up some clever physics based stuff from the editor UI. With some more testing and actual documentation, we can then sell it on the Unreal Marketplace. Personally, I couldn't consider making an Unreal project that wasn't structured, at least in part now, using plugins and therefore modules. Perhaps you'll give it a go and use modules and plugins to better structure your own projects. Admittedly, this was a rather long-winded and quite dry look at the subject. Unfortunately though, for some things, you just can't escape needing to learn some background before we can actually put the stuff into practice. But it just so happens that I have a plugin I need to make myself, and then I want to submit it to the Epic marketplace. It won't take a huge amount of code, and I want to bring you lovely game devs along with me for the ride. I'd like to open everything up so you can see the reality of the whole process. The initial concept, design, development, testing, packaging, and submission to Epic, and let you in on whatever feedback and corrections they tell me to make, where I go wrong, and how I can fix it. At the end, there should be a plugin that anyone can use from C++ or Blueprints, and you can download it free 
free from the marketplace. Or grab the project files from GitHub and poke around with them yourself. If you're not already, consider subscribing to the channel so that you know when that video and any others I make come out. You could also join our Discord server, where as well as complaining to each other about why stuff often doesn't work how we wanted it to first time, people do try to help each other with various problems and issues that arise while working on their Unreal games. And generally, chat about game dev things, share ideas, or show off whatever it is they're currently working on. Links in the video description. So once again, until next time, good luck with all your endeavours.